And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. Now, we should have to understand, this is a revelation, this is a vision that John is receiving. He has been taken, lifted up in the spirit into heaven. And God is showing him activities in heaven, and is also showing him what is yet to run. come. So these are not things that are happening currently, but things that are yet to do all. Come. He said the Lord, they gave him a rod, a measuring rod, and he is to measure the temple of God on earth, that temple in Jerusalem. He was to measure it, and then also leave the outskirts of it for the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles are the unbelievers, to leave it for the Gentiles. Why? We don't know. So, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and their holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty and two months, that's about three years and a half. Forty and two months, they are to tread on it. It could, it could, it could mean that they will do violence to that city, or it could mean that they just becoming in and out, threading the outside of the court. It says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. This is the same as for the two months. They are going to prophesy, they are going to preach. Two. Certain commentaries say that these two are Joshua and Moses, Elijah and Moses. But in as much as Moses, when during his lifetime, was able to stretch off his hand over the sea and it parted, that Elisha called, Elijah called fire from heaven, did all those things the word of God is saying in the book of Revelation, could not, does not necessarily mean that there are those two witnesses. It could be other witnesses, but whatever it is, God will have two witnesses. They may be prophets. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. They will be preaching against the ills and calling, talking about the judgment of the Lord that is going to come upon the earth. Now, how many of us know that those who preach those kind of messages are not popular? Hello? Show me somebody who preaches those sermons who has jet planes or a million dollar home. No, you wouldn't find them. The people who Live in those matches are those who tell the people what they want to hear. But these prophets are going to be preaching. They are going to be declaring God's judgment upon the earth to the extent that the people will be so angry at them. They will be so angry at them. Just like today, people see. Yes, that Friday when we were preaching, when we were having the service, now Georgia that left that out. You see somebody driving through and was blowing the horn. I say, I'm being disturbed by the message. They don't want to hear that God's judgment is coming upon the earth. Or they could be tooting the horn in agreement that, hey, we believe what you are saying. But most of the time, when they make those noises, you know that they really. There was one time one man gave me the middle finger. Yeah, that's what he did. Because he didn't want to hear the word, but that doesn't face me. Because that is God's word. Who knows? He says God is going to have his two servants. Two servants. He didn't name them. He said the two servants that we preach and prophesy in the truth, clothed in sackcloth. It means that at the time when the world is rejoicing and having all their parties, these two are clothed in sackcloth. And when they clothe in sackcloth, it signifies mourning and grief. They, they see something that the world is not seeing. And so they are mourning, they are identified. Look, my, they're telling the whole world that look, this is coming. You should repent. When we wear sackcloths or mourning clothes, it means that there's sorrow, there's sadness, there's destruction. It is right then when there is war and there is impending destruction, the prophets wear what? Sackcloth. Hezekiah, when the Syrians came against them, the same thing. They were sacked. 
So these prophets will wear sackcloth and they'll prophesy for three years and a half. Can you imagine three years and a half every day? The reason why they said 1,000 so many, many days, they want to let us know that every day they'll be what? Preaching. Every day. How would you like that? Every time you tell the corner, someone is telling the judgment is coming. Jesus is coming. Today you leave that church. Oh, no, no, no. We don't want that kind of church. We call it that church of, uh, what do you call it? Church of uh, Doom. We leave those churches. We want to go to the place that tells us what? That always has fun. Is that right? Fun fair. Now it's everything. And we shape the truth. So these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, in the opening of the book of Revelation, the first chapter, the candlestick denotes the church. Denotes the church. It said two candlesticks. In the opening chapter of chapter 1, it talks about seven candlesticks and then seven stars. The seven stars being the angels of the church and the seven candlesticks being the seven churches in Asia Minor. Here we are faced with another candlestick and there are two candlesticks. So this could be the church that stands for the truth, that proclaims the truth, that proclaims what? The truth. You know, truth hurts, but truth sets free. Hallelujah. Truth hurts, but truth does what? Sets free. And these are the two olive trees. When we talk about olive tree, we're talking about life. Out of the olive tree, we have oil. Is that right? We have the oil. So, talking about life, we're talking about the anointing of God. He said, and if any man will hurt them, God has so saturated with them with power that if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be what? Killed. Fire from the mouth of the prophets will kill them. The word of God is like fire. The word of God is quick and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God. So, it is coming a day, the Bible is saying, there is coming a day where God, God's prophets, these two designated prophets, will be so anointed, so much so that their words carry power that will devour those who will oppose them, who will seek to harm them. But who are those who are going to harm them? In fact, in the book of Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 2, it says that why do the earth rage, the heaven, heaven rage? The kings are filled with anger. They see, they just are angry against the righteousness of the righteous one. The earth as we are in today hates anything and everything that has to do with God. Politicians may use the name of God out of conveniency, political conveniency, so the Christians will vote for them. But they don't live that kind of life themselves. Because if they did, the poor will be relieved of their suffering. Politicians use the name of God for their own selfish ends. The kingdoms, let's read Psalm, Psalm 2. Let's, let's read Psalm 2 quickly. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain what, thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against who? The Lord, the Lord and against his what? Anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their what? Cause from us. The verse 4 says, He that sits in the heavens shall do what? Laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So you see, Revelation chapter 11 bears the resemblance of Psalm 1, Psalm 2. They will become angry. The heathen will become angry at these prophets and see what they will do. And he says, these have power to shut heaven. The prophets have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues 
as often as they will. So the people who say it is Moses and Elijah, they are saying it based on this because Moses and Elijah are the only ones who did this in their time. Moses before Pharaoh, he did this. Elijah also did it when he shut the rain up in the days of Ahab. Ahab. So they say it could be Moses and Elijah. But there is nowhere here stated that is stated that it's actually Moses and Elijah. God can use anyone he wants to use to do the same thing. And it says that when they, they shall have finished their testimony after three years and six months, after 1,260 days, after that, watch what is going to happen to them. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and do what? Kill them. Somebody will quickly say, well, maybe they vaccinated. That's why they were able to, they were killed by what? The beast. You know how we've, we've come to a place where we say, I'm so anointed that I will not die? Well, some of us have been made to believe that, that we shall not die. You, you are so anointed that you will not what? die. You are so anointed that you will never be sick. You are so anointed that you will never lack. But, but here are people who are so anointed that the words out of their mouth kills those who will come against them. And yet, at the end of a set time, the beast is able to make war with them and do what? And kill them. The beast is able to make war with them and kill them. And who allowed it? Who allows it? God. If God does not allow it, it will know what? Happen. Amen. God does what? Allow it. God allows it. There are situations in your life and in my life that God allows. Amen. There are situations in your life and my life that God does what? Allowed. So you and I have to desist from always complaining. Rather, we have to ask God to open our eyes that we can see and understand what we are going through. Because God allows. A case in point, Job. Hello? Who? Who what is his name? Job. Job. God allowed it. God allowed it. So God allows this prophets to be killed. And as soon as they were killed, watch what happens. They started sending gifts. The people were rejoicing that they have died. They were sending what? Gifts, celebrating. They allowed the body to lie down for three days untouched. No funeral service. Was it three days? And it says, and when they are finished, they were killed. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Now, when we talk about Sodom and Egypt, it's just, you know, it, it, it represents, it's not nearly Sodom itself. The earth, the world that we live in, is like Sodom and it's like what? Gomorrah. Our world is filled with sin, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Hello? Our world is Sodom and Gomorrah. When Jesus Christ came, he died on this earth. The earth in the eyes of the Lord is, is like a city. The earth. It's so small that a city even is bigger in the eyes of God. That is how our, our world is. So God can call our world any name. And here he says, so it calls our world Sodom and it calls our world, world Egypt. Egypt represents sin. Egypt represents a place of captivity. That is where the children of Israel were held captive. A sin that is where Jesus Christ also died, that is in on this earth. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies. How many days? Three and a half days, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in their graves. Can you imagine already? Uh, there's decomposition, the smelling going to have, take place. But God has his own plan. Hello? God has his own plan. If God, if they allow him to just lay there in one day, the people will say, well, they are not, they were not really what? Dead. But you cannot be in a coma for three and a half days. So for three and a half days, they were rejoicing. And they were sending out what? Gifts. Now, this is going to happen. It has not already happened. It's going to what? Happen. Three and a half day, they were giving gifts. And rejoicing because their nemesis 
or their enemy, the one who has been really getting on their case, preaching against everything that they do. How many of us believe and know that there are people today who stand for the truth, for righteousness, who have always been preaching the word of God? When they die, there are people who rejoice that they are going to die. They rejoice. Why? Because they have been on their case too much. It says, and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies, and they shall dwell, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. Rejoice because they are what? Dead. And make what? Merry. And shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on earth. I trust and pray that the day when I die, Somebody will send a message to me that, Pastor, they are rejoicing because you have not preaching those hard messages anymore. That will gladden me before the Lord because it means that I'm doing something what right. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We have, we have to stand on God's word side. These people knew they were faced with opposition. These two witnesses. They knew that their life was in danger, and yet they did not hold back. They preached the truth so much so that the people of the world thought that they were tormenting them. And they were praying that they would die, and indeed they died. So now they are rejoicing and giving gifts. They were having cookouts. They were having all kinds of fanfares because their nemesis, the two prophets, have died. These are the ones who tormented them. They have died. But watch what happens. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. It's going to happen. Hallelujah. It's going to what? Happen. The situation that you find yourself in is not a hopeless situation. If your hand is in the hand of God, hello? If your hand is in the hand of God, if you and I know that you are walking in the perfect will of God, then please, the trial that you are going through, it may seem as if you are dead three days and what? And a half. The same God who is going to cause the spirit to come into the lives of this, into the bodies of these lifeless beings. When their bodies have started decomposing and revive them, the same spirit will do what? Revive you also. That is why it is not good for you and I to give up on God too soon. During those times when you are going through, through trials, when it seems like all the world is up against you, that is also when your friends will abandon you. And that is also when Satan will come to be throwing things in front of you, telling you that, my friend, I want to help you out. That is where you need to be discerning. Because these bodies that are lifeless, there are times when you and I have to think that we are what? Dead. We have to be dead to the world and alive unto, all, unto God. They were dead to the world. And you and I have to be dead to the world so much so that the enticements of this world will not get to us. Hallelujah. The times when you and I are going through, the difficult times, is when Satan comes. Because he knows that it's your weakest point. He knows that it's your what? Your weakest point. And that he can get you to compromise. Kofi and I were with Dr. Ofori uh, this past week. Was it Friday or something? Was it Friday? Yeah. And I saw on his wall Peter's law. Peter's law says that when you are asked to compromise, Peter's law says when you are asked to compromise, ask for more. That is, if you find your place in a position to try to cut corners, to compromise, no matter how hard the thing is, ask for more. Don't compromise. Jesus Christ said the same thing. He says if you are asked to go one mile, go how many miles? Two. So when the situation becomes so tough and your back is to the wall that you and I don't have to compromise. 
that is when you have to be dead to the things of what of the world and when you and i consider ourselves dead to the things of the world that is when the holy spirit of god comes and that's what he does best to revive you and i hallelujah we shall see this happen very soon. That's what the word of God is saying. It said they were revived. They rose up. And when they rose up, fear fell upon them which saw them. When God does the unimaginable, when God does the unimaginable, fear comes upon the people who knew you at first. Remember Job? All his Friends, they saw him wrapped with sores. They were all prophesying and talking to him about how sinful and how wicked he was. But then the day they saw that this man has been healed, fear came upon them. And so when God told them to do what they had to do to bring in gifts, they had to hurry because they are afraid of God's what? wrath. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. When you are going through trials, don't think that the enemy doesn't know the God that you are serving. He's just waiting for you to compromise. And when you and I compromise, he wins. But if you don't compromise and you hold strong to God's unchanging hand, the day when God steps in for you, fear will come upon them. Hallelujah. Amen. Fear will come upon them. Amen. And it says, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, come up hither. God called the two witnesses, called them, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. These are people who were killed. Satan killed them. But now they have been revived and they are ascended into heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. They were killed. The world will seek to kill you and I. Amen. Jesus said, don't be afraid of he who can kill the flesh, but not kill what? The soul. Satan killed the flesh, but the Lord revived the soul. And the same hour was there an earthquake. It says, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. The tenth part of the world fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. Amen. Amen. There is a time of judgment coming. God kills. Hello? God does what? Yes. If anybody says that God doesn't kill, the day of God's killing will come. The day when God will kill, he will kill. And when God kills, he is justified. Hello? On that day of judgment, there are going to be many who will be killed. Listen to what he says. He says, there was an earthquake. Who caused the earthquake? Yeah. Amen. And then it says, a thousand were killed. Seven thousand were killed. And the, those who were left behind were affrighted. They were afraid. Because they saw what God has done. First, they saw the three, two witnesses revived. Fear came upon them. Now they see earthquake. They are more afraid. And now they open their mouths and give glory to God. Do they give glory to God because they're giving their lives to Jesus? No. There are people who give glory and their hearts is far away. But at least they open their mouth and say, indeed, truly there is one, God. But there's one thing giving glory to God and there's another thing giving your whole heart to, to Him. So they gave glory to God for fear of what they have seen. The second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. This again is the future. It's a futuristic thing that we are talking about. Are you all with me? It's a futuristic one thing. It's going to happen. So if we know that this is going to happen, we have to prepare ourselves against all odds. And the only way we can prepare ourselves is to make sure that our hands are holding the Lord so what tight. 
that we don't let go. That we don't let go of him. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That was the voice of the, what came out of heaven. The seventh angel sounded the trumpet. We've heard the six trumpets sounded by the angels, six angels. Now the seventh one is sounding. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Remember Psalm 2? The earth, the heaving did what? Rage. The kings gathered, and they are angry at, at God and his, 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 his servants, and they said, let us cast them, let us destroy them. But God heard all of that, and God laughed at them. Now God is responding to them. God is responding to them. He's responding with his judgment. And now it has been declared that the earth that the kings thought belonged to them has become the kingdom of, all, of God. Are you following what we're talking about? The earth is become the kingdom of who? Yeah. Of God. That's what is being said in heaven. Yeah. So the earth, the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. God himself shall reign. There is coming a day when God will stamp his authority over the whole nations of, of the earth. As far as I know today there is no nation that can claim, claim to be a Christian nation. Hello? Yeah. There is no nation that can claim to be what? A Christian nation. There is no nothing like a Christian nation. There are nations with Christians in them. There are nations with what? Christians in them. Don't let anybody blow smoke over your eyes. The nations are all the kingdoms of darkness. The things that they do in the nations are not pleasing to God. But there is coming a day when God will stamp his authority over, all, over the nations. Where sin, iniquity, and all these things will be perished. There will be no more war. Hello? Yeah. There will be no more what? war. Children can tell the difference between tender and born. When the Lord's reign comes. Today, there are nations, places where children can not tell the difference between a tender and a born. They can't tell the difference between crackers and bullets, rare bullets, because they are living in war zones. They are, they are in misery. There's no joy because Satan is the one ruling. But there is coming a day when the kingdoms of this earth are becoming, we're going to become the kingdom of God. When the Prince of Peace is himself will reign supreme and children will be at peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Children will be what? At peace. Children be at peace. Hallelujah. Amen. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and did what? Worship. Worship. In chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, that's where we heard the four and twenty elders. That's the first time they fell on their faces. But here we hear them again. They are falling on their faces. And what is the song that they are singing? We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has what? Right. They are, they are celebrating God for his patience. Because over the years, I can hear them say, God, why won't you act? They watch atomic bomb being dropped over a whole nation. They watch people killed and died. And they say, God, why don't you act? And God says, just wait. Wait. They watch governments declare wars based on lies. And they say, God, why don't you? God says, just wait. They watch the wickedness of men. They watch time and time again. And now finally they see God what? Taking power and what reigning. God bringing all those foolishness and wickedness to a screeching what halt. That is why they bow, 
They fell on their faces and worshipped God. They worship God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to do all. Come, because thou hast taken to thee thy power, and thou hast what? Reign. As I read this scripture this morning, around 1 a.m., this is the music that the Lord gave me. And I pray that it will sound good. I, I wrote it. I wrote some small piece on that. So let me share it with, with, with you all. You may not have a name on earth, 
but in heaven you have a name. Hallelujah. In heaven you are born. A name. And God remembers your name. And on that day, he will give rewards to those who have walked in lockstep with him, upright with him. God will do that. So you and I don't have to do a compromise. We don't have to give up. Your back may be to the wall. Don't do what? Give up. Your body may be racked in pain. Don't do what? Give up. Every, every example, everything in the Bible there is for you and for me, our example. If there is a Lazarus, if there is a Lazarus, Lazarus in the Bible, about the poor Lazarus, and you find yourself poor, know that it is an example for you and I. Because that Lazarus in the Bible, that rich man and the poor Lazarus, the Lazarus, that Lazarus never came out of his poverty. Did he? Did he? No. But when he died, where did he go? Uh huh. So you see, all those things are examples for you and I. So that your condition, your situation shouldn't be one that the death that causes you to begin to say, God, am I am I righteous or not? As long as you know that you are in the Lord, continue to be faithful to him. Hallelujah. If there is a Lazarus, hallelujah, there is hope for you. Amen. Amen. If there is a Lazarus who never came out of his poverty and yet died in his poverty and heaven was his home, then there is hope for you. If there is a Lazarus who was sick and Jesus didn't come when he was sick, he didn't come. He came after he was what? Dead. There is hope for you. Hallelujah. There is what? Hope for you. There is hope for you. If there is a prophet by name Elisha, who was so anointed, a double portion of the anointing of Elijah was on him. He parted the river Jordan and walked through it. He called birds from the bush to eat the flesh of those children. He resurrected a dead child. And yet the Bible says that he died of his sickness. Hello? He died of his what? He died of his what? Sickness. If there is an Elisha, I have hope. If there is an Elisha, I have hope. Don't get to the place of, well, I've been serving God faithfully and now I am sick. God has not abandoned you. He hasn't. Because the same Elisha, his bow, revival, a dead man. If he were a sinner because of his sickness, his bow would not revive all, a dead body. Hallelujah. And if there are these two witnesses who were so strong, so much so that the people really feared them, and yet Satan overpowered them and killed them. If there are those two who on the third day, three days and a half, God raised them from the dead, your situation is no different. God will revive you on the third one. So we have to put our trust in him. We have to do what? Put our trust in him totally, absolutely, without compromising. Because compromise gives Satan a platform. When we compromise, it gives Satan a platform to point fingers at who? God. He said, God, I thought you said this people love you. God, I thought, do you know how many of us who go to the clubs? Hello? How many of us? I don't want to begin to ask how many of you went to the club over the weekend. I don't want to ask you. But do you know? <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you know how many of us who spend Friday nights or Saturday at the club who call ourselves Christians? How many of us give platform to Satan? Every day, Friday night, Satan is happy. Because that is when he stands before God and say, God, and he shows him, he say, God, okay, now you look at that. Just God, open. Just let us look at that, uh, what do you call it? Nice club. Let's look there. I'm going to point out some of the children to you. See? That's the man you say is your pastor. <laughs> God say who? He said, that's not a pastor. Come over there. Do that break that. <laughs> 
himself is a pastor. You see how we make, we put, if there's something called shame, we put God to work. The Bible says, for your sake, the word of God is blasphemed. But our lifestyle, when we are found in every place that we are not supposed to want to be. But just because we want to make our friends feel good, or we want to be accepted in their fold, we find ourselves going to those places. Satan has a good time of that, pointing us out to who? To God. And that's hypocrisy. So it is my prayer that we will not compromise. Even if friends abandon us, know that God with you is more than a friend. And let's satisfy God's perfect will. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I will stop here. Amen. Amen. Before you all go to sleep on me. Before the last person crosses his eyes to go to sleep at all. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Oh, the earth below will above. For he is so precious to me. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, the word you gave unto me today, I have expounded it to us concerning the book of Revelation chapter 11. I pray for grace, O God, that you help us to be steadfast in our walk with you, that we shall not look to the left or to the right, nor to the back, but we shall look ahead to Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. May we be found amongst those people who will receive reward. Receive reward from your presence because we walked with you and abode in your perfect will. Keep us close to you, O oh God. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. We thanksgiving. And the saints of God we shall say, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Go by her house and see her garden. Small place, the things that she's planted there. This woman is a hard working woman. She does it every year. A garden, beautiful garden. Amen. Amen. Master, we thank you. I don't know when you get a time to do a garden. You are always here cleaning and doing all those things. God bless you, my son. Amen. 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 Oh, that time. Of the trees of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unpleasurable are his judgment and his ways as finding out for who has known the mind of the Lord or who of the Lord has been oh, oh the depths of the riches of the
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now forevermore.